I'm going to introduce now Professor Sven Eric Rose, director of the program in Jewish studies at UC Davis, uh, where he teaches in German comparative literature and Jewish studies. His scholarship focuses primarily on German Jewish intellectual history and literature from the 18th century to the present and on literature of the Holocaust in German, Yiddish, and French. His book, Jewish Philosophical Politics in Germany, 1789 to 1848, received the 2015 Jordan Schnitzer Book Award from the Association for Jewish Studies in the category of philosophy and Jewish thought. He recently, his recently completed book, manuscript, Making and Unmaking Literature in the Warsaw, Lodz, and Vilna Ghettos is currently under review. And um, Dr. Rose's talk today is entitled Ethics and Extremists in the Warsaw Ghetto Writings of Yitzchak Bernstein. Welcome. Thank you for that, um, Sam. So I'm going to be talking about um, Yitzhak Bernstein, who's a not very well-known figure um, from the uh, uh, from from Warsaw, well, from from Poland, and and was in the Warsaw Ghetto. And uh, to to back up, uh, there was a, a, a text by a, a very prominent uh, Yiddish novelist, Shia Perla, uh, who started writing during the Great Deportation of the Warsaw Ghetto, and he he titled it Gerush Varsha. And a little bit later, he crossed out Gerush and wrote Kurban. Varsha. Um, these texts uh, that I'm talking about by Bernstein don't go beyond autumn of 1941, so a bit before that, but um, they are, in a sense, about Kurban Varsha, uh, and we, we, I think about them in, in, um, in the context of Kurban Alza, uh, and I don't have really anything uh, helpful uh, to say about that except for that talking about famine uh, in, in the Warsaw Ghetto in these times is obviously very... Uh, horrifically um, resonant. And um, uh, the other thing that I would say is that uh, we return to during the Holocaust, not, not the chronotope of after Auschwitz, but we return to during. And I think that's an important perspective as we are in the midst of, um, of, of the situation that we are in. So descended from a renowned Hasidic family, Yitzhak Bernstein was born in Plotsk in 1900. Uh, following both traditional and secular education, cheder, yeshiva, uh, gymnasium, then studies in humanities and law at Warsaw University, he taught Jewish religion at a Polish-language Jewish state school, Regierungsschule in Yiddish, and was active in Zionist circles. Prior to the war, Bernstein published some half-dozen articles, several in early issues of Yivo Blätter, uh, on pedagogical and psychological topics as well as literary criticism. He was killed in an action uh, in early 1943. In the Warsaw Ghetto, Bernstein was a member of Emanuel Ringelblum's Oynik Shabbos team and wrote a substantial number of short prose texts in Yiddish that were preserved in the first cache of the archive, which was buried in, on August 3rd, 1942 and excavated on September 18, 1946. One Oynik Shabbos file uh, comprises 12 readily legible typescript pages, and a second file contains two copies, both damaged, of a 31-page typescript. These writings range from literary criticism to philosophical theological meditations, sometimes bordering on sermons, to literary vignettes or prose poems. Taken together, these far-ranging texts constitute a significant corpus of ghetto writings that to date has received virtually no uh, scholarly attention. In his capacity as head of the post-war uh, Warsaw Jewish Historical Institute, where the original Oynik Shabbos documents found their home, Bear Mark published Bernstein's stunning prose poem, uh, Warsaw 5701, that is Warsaw uh, 1941, in his uh, Bear Mark's 1954 anthology, Between Life and Death. Not without some Stalinist era editorial manipulations. Uh, all of Bernstein's preserved texts have been published in Polish translation in the Polish edition of the Oynik Shabbos uh, archive, but to my knowledge, no text of Bernstein's wartime writings uh, has been published in English. I'm currently preparing um, that uh, the prose poem that I just mentioned, uh, Warsaw 1940, uh, 1941, uh, for inclusion as an appendix in a forthcoming issue of Shofar in honor of uh, Sam Kassow. 
And this is my first ch uh, shot at the article that will be my uh, contribution eventually. So uh, following Amos Goldberg's call for greater attention to how Jewish sources from the ghettos record the experience of radical transformation and disintegration of social and cultural systems of meaning, I am currently pondering how Bernstein's writings reflect and reflect on the changing status of ethics and moral judgment over a two-year period from autumn 19, uh, 1939 through late 1941. Bernstein was a moralist, and ethical concerns are at the heart of virtually every text he wrote during this span. His relatively lengthy essay on the classic Yiddish writer Sholem Yankov Abramov, uh, Abramovich, or Mendel Moichersforim, and Yitzhak Leibish Peretz appears to be among the earliest of his wartime texts. In it, Bernstein is chiefly interested in Abramovich and Peretz as what he calls two contrasting types of ethical genius reminding any readers inclined to appreciate these authors' work in purely aesthetic terms that, quote, our holy mountain is Sinai, not Parnassus or Olympus. And on Sinai, divine beauty revealed itself through ethical laws, through social laws that establish a just earthly life, end quote. Bernstein's persistent preoccupation with ethics allows us to follow an evolution from early confidence and optimism that ethical values could provide Jewish Warsaw an effective means of contending with the crisis initiated by the war to a vastly more dire situation in which the prerequisite of ethical judgment that people in fact possess ethical agency has fallen into horrific doubt. Whereas his ethical lens initially offers Bernstein a way to reckon with the crisis, the logic of ethical categories eventually falls into crisis. Some of Bernstein's most stunning writing issues from his continued commitment to ethical thought after so many prerequisites of coherent ethical discourse have eroded. His commitment, in other words, to ethics in crisis. Bernstein's essay, How the Outbreak of the War Has Affected the Jewish Person's Psyche, is representative of the early pieces he wrote while still optimistic that Jews um, might be able to learn ethical lessons from the horrors of the war and that those lessons could aid them in collectively weathering the storm. Ostensibly written in autumn 1939, the essay begins in uh, the vein of the quasi-academic articles Bernstein published in the early 1930s. Indeed, he describes his theme, quote, what effects has the outbreak of war had, end quote, as, quote, a profound question for uh, the social psychologist, end quote. However, given the circumstances, no empirical research can be conducted. Uh, thus, Bernstein can only appeal to what he believes the likely result would be of a purely hypothetical survey, uh, were it able to be done, of the Jewish masses. He ventures that most Jews would respond that the outbreak of the war has had a positive effect on, quote, unquote, the Jewish heart. Shifting from uh, this formal academic discourse to the more sermonizing tone that dominates most of the essay, Bernstein speculates that this postulated optimism is a product of the socially leveling effect of the bombardments. Quote, the destruction and wreckage haven't spared the wealthy echelons. The devastating firebombs made no distinction between palace and attic room. Human egoism, Bernstein writes, suffered a death knell, end quote. Remarkably, Bernstein interprets the early events of the war as a violent concretization of the moral maxim, quote, no fortune helps in the days of wrath and charity, tzedakah, saves you from death, end quote. To wealthy, egoistic people, a new world of basic need like hunger and cold was revealed. Quote, ashamed and like balichuvas, uh, such people's faces had acquired have acquired softer characteristics and a spark of better humanity in their eyes. The shared misfortune uh, brought them together, person to person, walls fell away, end quote. Ascendum gefallen mechitzes, he says in Yiddish. Uh, crucial here is that Bernstein uh, sees the horrible events of the first phase of the war as in alignment with the moral lessons of prophets of old or their contemporary heirs, Musar preachers. Quote, the most tragic illustrations of the erstwhile prophet and of our contemporary Musar preacher have become reality. Death, with its ineluctable scythe, has cut off children from parents and parents from children, annihilated men and women, or husband and wife, Fartilik Mann and Freud. And uh, the, the, uh, the most frightening uh, illustrations, Mesholim, uh, that a prophet or preacher in the Shevet Musar or Terror Musar tradition could summon have now become manifest. Yet these 
uh, realized Misholim still harmonize with the teachings of prophets and Musar preachers. Reality itself is teaching moral lessons in the form of the socially equalizing calamity of the war. In Bernstein's formulation, it's a lesson taught by facts, not mere words. This text dates from before the establishment of the Warsaw Ghetto in late fall 1940, yet although Bernstein's ethical uh, parsing of events evolves continuously with the events, his faith in the possibility and efficacy of an ethical communal response to the calamity remains unshaken in a drosh he wrote on the Book of Ruth for Shavuos 5701, which fell on May 31st to June 2nd, 1941. Describing Ruth as an ancient patriarchal story of family calamity and family, and family loyalty, Bernstein writes that, quote, in the year 5701, we hear Ruth as an idol, uh, as an idol uh, of about hunger, end quote. A paradoxical conf confluence, he notes, between the calm and gentle feeling of the genre of the uh, idol, I want to say idyll, but I think it's wrong, uh, and, uh, and the scourge of hunger. Ruth uh, Bernstein comments, a bit of an extended quote. I'm giving a lot of quotation to him because I feel he's simply never been quoted. Um, uh, Ruth Bernstein comments, is a story of famine and homelessness, but also of human loyalty. Hunger and homelessness become a touchstone for human loyalty. Misfortune engenders the need for social aid. Ruth walks behind the reapers and gathers ears of grain. Boaz takes Ruth under his wing and marries her. That love born in calamity is blessed by God. King David is born in one of the branches of their children. A wonderful tale about hunger and homelessness, which are transformed into human solidarity and social aid, ending in love and being blessed by heaven. Is this not a symbol that hunger and homelessness must lead to loyalty between people, to protection, to love? Life's difficulties uh, create the possibility for great virtue. Ruth does not abandon Naomi in her great need, and Boaz leads protection, lends protection to the solitary woman. Calamity offers an occasion for ethical deeds. Calamity carries great virtue in the folds of its garment." End quote. Admittedly, the hermeneutic dictates of, a, of an occasional drosh, such as this, might encourage Bernstein to distill the most optimistic moral lessons possible under the increasingly dire circumstances. That he wasn't always so sanguine about the community's ability to meet what he saw as the ethical challenges of the calamity becomes uh, evident in several texts. In Der Kelmer Magid, uh, written sometime in 1941, Bernstein repeatedly poses the rhetorical question, where is the Kelmer Magid, i.e. Moses Isaac ben Noah Darshan, 1823 to 1900, the most celebrated Magid of the 19th century. Bernstein is asking who or what, amid the horrors of the ghetto, could reimpose the moral paradigm for which his invocation of the Magid does shorthand. A preacher in the quote, uh, in, the, in the Shevet or terror tradition, uh, the Kelmer Magid in Bernstein's description was someone who ignited congregations with terror uh, and retri uh, of retribution, but solemn. Quote, who called forth human consciousness amid cries and wailing, end quote. Bernstein asked, where is the Kelmer Magid who could frighten people into moral rectitude now with visions of punishment and hell, Genem, when Genem is manifest in the streets and famine is coming for them all? Where, uh, whereas Bernstein saw the events of the bombardment of Warsaw as harmonizing with moral lessons a Musar Magid would want to impart, and is in fact affecting moral improvement, humility, empathy, solidarity, now the hellish reality fails to awaken people's blunted moral conscience. If the terrible facts continue to tell a moral tale, and in the guise of a terror Musar Magid manke, Bernstein desperately uh, insists that they do, the ghetto's inhabitants seem no longer able to receive the lesson, and now a, a rather longer uh, quote. Um, don't you believe in retribution, but Solomon? Don't you believe that for the sins of Sodom, a, uh, a rain of fire will come from the sky? That sins call forth a flood? That sins call forth annihilation? Mita keneged mita, measure for measure? You don't believe in hell? Uh, you, uh, you who walk in the street of Warsaw in 1941, you don't believe in Genem? Or do you believe in Genem for others, but not for yourself? You clever ones, rationalists, apicorsum, you don't believe in Genem? Who are not, uh, who, you who are not pained uh, by the suffering of others, who don't go mad when you walk over the streets paved with children's skulls? Hear calm and assured people and be disquieted. A plague is coming to destroy us, to annihilate us. 
The bloody spit from the starving, every breath from their wasted bodies, every vapor emitted from their blood and marrow, the curse said silently by their bodies and the creeping prayer they say aloud will ignite wrath, bolded. When so neglected, hunger becomes infested with maggots and is transformed into a scythe that cuts poor and rich. Retribution is at our doors. The relentless specter, man and woman, young and old, poor and rich, mita connected mita, measure for measure. Where can you find the Kelmer Magid who would cast terror, pachad, uh, over you, like a choking rope around your throats, who would melt your stone hearts, who would extract from, uh, from you with tongs the resolution to share the last bit of food uh, with the hungry, who would compel you to decide to act? Where can you find the stringent, angry Jew, the Kelmer Magid, who uh, would make consciences shudder, who would show you another realm of hell, namely retribution for the deaths of brothers by starvation, when the first realm, famine, is not sufficient? Where can you find a Kelmer Magid who would break you to make you whole?" End quote. Retribution is coming for everyone in the form of death by starvation, regardless of social or economic position, age or gender. Yet this manifestation of the horrors of Genem have no efficacy as a moral teaching. Mutual support, Bernstein submits, is the only path to collective salvation, but people's consciences are so deadened that the terror sermon ubiquitously manifest in the streets of Warsaw has lost all moral force. What vision of terrible punishment could a Kelmer Magid possibly summon that would be effective when the hell people are witnessing daily can't jolt uh, them into acting ethically? The writing, including Der Kelmer Magid, in which Bernstein grapples with famine in the ghetto, while not always precisely dated, stemmed from 1941. While starvation was a, was a widespread phenomenon across all Nazi ghettos, its intensity waxed and waned according to particular timelines in any given one. The Warsaw Ghetto was sealed in November 1940, and by spring 1941, the death rate began to skyrocket. It reached 1,000 uh, for February, over 2,000 for April, 3,800 for May. The death rate reached 5,500 for July and peaked in August 1941 at 5,560, the maximum for any uh, single month in the Warsaw Ghetto. These months of extreme famine are the backdrop for Bernstein's famine text. I don't have the time to say much about what I think is Bernstein's single most stunning text about famine, disease, and destitution in the Warsaw Ghetto, his apocalyptic prose poem, Warsaw 1941, uh, which he wrote only weeks before Leib Golden in August 1941, penned his brilliant and moderately better known modernist autobiographical short story, Chronicle of 24 uh, Hours. Bernstein's text, incidentally, this is the one that I'm translating for the, for the uh, for publication in Shofar, is dated uh, according to the traditional uh, Jewish calendar in Tammuz uh, 5701, or June 26, July 24, 1941. The text opens with a prolonged apostrophe to Warsaw, to Jewish Warsaw, including the passage, uh, Warsaw, you glare and dazzle as if with precious stones, with scurvy and boils that blossom on human faces and on tortured bodies. Warsaw, Varsha, you are an altar for the helpless and a living memorial to Satan, a memorial to extinguished consciences. Warsaw, you are vast and sinful. You are pain and misfortune." Unquote. The apocalyptic tone sets the stage for the arresting images and quasi-allegorical figures who populate the text, the maimed, starving, marginalized, and dying, whose appeals for aid fall on deaf ears. These dying figures embody the sacred, become iridescent prophets who burn, blaze, and sputter, illuminating the ghetto's hellscape. It is not that the ghetto has become devoid of the sacred. On the contrary, it is the scene of an awful and awesome sacred excess, an orgy of the sacred from which moral lessons can hardly be drawn uh, or learned. Uh, this is above all because, as Bernstein stresses repeatedly, Warsaw, you are a cemetery of consciences, a base hakvuris. Uh, the death of conscience runs like a leitmotif through Bernstein's writings, and this is, essay is something of an explosive turning point at which the assertion that moral consciences are dead remains the fierce ethical accusation and call to concern for others that it has been across his earlier text, even as it shades into a desperate acknowledgement that traditional moral conscience is also dead in the sense that it can have little purchase on the overwhelming circumstances. The death of moral consciences is not merely so many individual failures, 
but a collapse of the category. This crisis and moral agency comes to the fore in an undated text, Kiddush Hashem, in which Bernstein contrasts the situation of Jewish martyrs of old with that of Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto. In 1950s Poland, Bear Mark read this text as indicative of an unhealthy mystical longing for martyrdom. But the longing at issue is rather clearly for the measure of moral agency afforded by people able to die meaningfully. Quote, we thirst for the beauty and pain and suffering from one's own resolve. We thirst for the heroism and of the lion-hearted who uh, force themselves to their knees in the service of holiness, of something higher than one's own life. We thirst for the beauty and heroism, the grandeur and glory, hodun, tefora, of martyrdom, of free choice, and then bolded, because we were not given a choice. That's a repeated phrase in bold throughout the text, uh, end quote. In contrast to the venerated martyrs of old, quote, we are suffering and dying without the consciousness of an accomplished mission, end quote. The loss of moral agency remains the central concern of the final text I'll discuss today. Its title is uh, Yom Kippur. And uh, we can read it as a sibling of Bernstein's Shavuos Drosh on Ruth. Here, however, Bernstein meditates not on what moral lessons Warsaw's Jews should be learning from the awful circumstances, but rather on whether the helpless can be judged. As the community's sins and fate are being weighed, they have but one defense, their abjection. Quote, Warsaw, it's eternally Yom Kippur in you now. Bodies are aflame and souls sputter. Over your buildings and walls, measures and scales rise to heaven, and your fate is being weighed, worthy or guilty. Zoeche tzichayev. Your accusing angels, kategers, go in black and prepare for your day of judgment. And there is no defending angel, no saneger, uh, there for you. Helplessness is your defender, impotence, piteousness, and decline. For can you judge Mishpatin helplessness? Bernstein repeats the charge uh, he made in so many texts that, quote, one's heart doesn't feel the suffering of others. But now, uh, this evidence, th but now this is evidence less of the community's moral failure than the result of its having fallen beneath the threshold of moral agency altogether. The community uh, stands not before God, uh, stands before God on Yom Kippur, not as so many human beings, but rather as abject worms. Quote, a sinful community stands and laments, we have long forgotten the Ten Commandments. The wind has wiped away the words from the stone and their imprints in our hearts. We can't remember them, the Ten Commandments. God's finger once wrote them for human beings who resemble God but not for human worms. We don't remember them. We don't understand them. One's heart doesn't feel another's pain. It doesn't even feel one's own pain. Feeling has been silenced. We no longer know what suffering is because we don't feel. We don't know what such a thing as compassion is and we don't understand justice. We've forgotten it. We, know it, uh, we knew it in our earlier existence when we felt sin consciously and of our, fr of our own free will. Today, we are worms, a thousand times more wretched than slaves. Or did you write the Ten Commandments for worms? We step on each other. We raise ourselves up o over one another with pride. Keep the storehouses locked so that, God forbid, none of the starving should partake. Written for human beings who resemble God, the laws don't apply to us. We are human worms, so can we be judged for not upholding the laws of human gods? Above our walls rise measures and scales. Worthy or guilty? The scales teeter as in a tempest. They vacillate and fall silent." End quote. If, quote, our helplessness is our armor before God and before decent people and before Satan, end quote, such protection from moral condemnation is paid for with the price of the loss of human status. Abjection has entailed the collapse of the paradigm of moral judgment put the divine scales of judgment out of commission and left them teetering silently in the storm. By way of conclusion, I want to emphasize how for Bernstein's ethics, uh, how for Bernstein ethics are both are and are not suspended in the face of the increasingly dire circumstances of the Warsaw Ghetto. 
he diagnoses a collapse of the viability of ethics and judgment, but very much from within an ethical framework or discourse. That is, he continues to use ethics as a prism for interpreting horrible realities even after many of the preconditions for ethical judgment have been thoroughly eroded. Bernstein's ethical thinking doesn't stop at the threshold of its own impossibility. The crisis that Bernstein tried to meet with ethical interpretation and admonishment ineluctably engulfed the very categories undergirding such strategies. Yet Bernstein keeps thinking and writing in an ethical mode. His ethics enter the crisis, and his ethics in crisis give anguished, arresting, unsettling, and at times terrifyingly beautiful voice to the experience of the catastrophe unfolding in real time. And I'll end there.